एक मिनट लाइव हो जाए और रिकॉर्डिंग ऑन हो जाए ठीक है हेलो एन ए वेरी गुड इवनिंग टू वन एंड ऑल प्रेजेंट हियर टुडे वेलकम यू ऑल टू द एट डे ऑफ इंटरनेशनल ट्रेनिंग कम सर्टिफिकेट कोर्स ऑन प्रोसीजन एग्रीकल्चर well said by billy gates that innovation that are guided by a small holded farmer adapted by local circumstances and sustainable for the economy and environment will be necessary to ensure food security for the future so here we have with us an eminent scientist from university uh, from indian institute of technology kanpur dr rajiv sinha sir He did his master degree from apply in applied geology from University of Roorkee in 1987 and doctoral degree in sedimentology from University of Cambridge in 1992. Professor Sina has worked on various aspects of river hydrology, groundwater system and has joined as a faculty in the Department of Civil Engineering in the IIT Kanpur in 1994. He created the Department of Earth Science at IIT Kanpur in 2014 and focused on various other aspects in this period. Professor Sina is one of the foremost scientists in the country with work specialization in river dynamic, flood risk analysis, alluvial stratification, flood control, river health assessment, and wetland studies. He is a recipient of Alexander von Humboldt Fellowship in 2000. 2000 he received national mineralization award by university and is the editor board editorial board member of many reputed journal as we all know that the water is one of the important aspect of any agriculture crop so professor sina has worked on water hydro hydrology as we know that different crop have different condition and once we are growing the crop it faces different circumstances or environmental situation like different crops goes through erosions flood condition so all this aspect has been well studied by sir so i welcome sir on the behalf of agri meet to deliver a lecture which would be very uh, beneficial and important aspect in the part of agriculture for all of our participants so sir please thank you very much for introducing me uh, <clears throat> i hope you can see my screen properly can you confirm that yes sir yes, yes sir feel to visible yes okay all right so i'm very happy to be here and thank you ankur for uh, inviting me to this very important you know uh, event i can see there are more than 200 participants in this meeting and i believe uh they are all from different kinds of backgrounds but mostly focused on agriculture i suppose uh now the topic uh which i am going to talk upon today is uh related to remote sensing and uh, uh you know we will start today with the fundamentals of remote sensing uh what kind of uh, satellites are there what kind of platforms are there what kind of sensors are there uh and uh, you know because as you might already know that remote sensing data particularly from the satellite you know uh, platforms uh, is is becoming an extremely powerful resource for uh, managing the agriculture sector and uh, so it's it's very important to know what we have at our hand what kind of data sets how do we process it uh, i apologize right in the beginning that some of you may be aware with a lot of the things which we talk about today and maybe tomorrow but please bear with me because i have been told to keep the uh, lecture to you know very basics of remote sensing because many of you may not have had any experience or you know or, or exposure to the remote sensing you know data sets so let me start by you know trying to uh, explain what we are talking about what are we talking about in terms of the data sets where is the data coming from uh now fundamentally you know almost all remote sensing data come uh you know because we have the, the energy source for that you know data set is basically sun because we are most of the time we you know we are dealing with the optical data sets 
No, so sun is the universal source for most of the remote sensing data acquired by the satellites. Uh, that data, you know, that energy obviously comes through the absorption, you know, phenomena or a scattering phenomena because it has to pass through the, the atmosphere. It then is, you know, received by the earth and then it is reflected by the earth and it is then sensed by the remote sensor, which is basically, you know, some sort of a cameras and other kind of sensor which are installed on our satellites. And from that sensor, we receive the remote sensing data, we process it, and then you know we analyze them for our own purposes. Now, so there are, this is how most of the remote sensing data sets work. In some cases, uh, we actually you know, throw some energy from the, uh, from the remote sensing platforms. Like for example, when we acquire the uh, radar data, these are called active remote sensing data. We will not talk much about that today. Uh, I'll talk about, you know, a uh, little, you know, start with how the electromagnetic spectrum looks like uh, and what is the source, what are the energy which are available for remote sensing, what are the, you know, typical and the most common optical wavelength we talk, you know, we normally work with, and then what is spatial and spectral resolution of the, of the data sets and how do we ultimately process it. So this is kind of a general framework for uh, the lecture today and then tomorrow we'll talk about the digital data processing and then after we'll talk about the GIS based operations as well. Okay now first thing first we must try to understand before we get into the remote sensing data that what is the earth's energy budget looking like because that is the fundamental principle behind the electromagnetic spectrum and the energy available for remote sensing. Now, you must realize that, you know, the out of about 100% of the incoming solar radiation, uh, about 30% is actually reflected back to space from the upper atmosphere itself. And, and then 70% of that eventually, you know, reaches the, the earth. Uh, and then out of that, a uh, lot of, you know, that is absorbed by the atmosphere itself, uh, clouds, and, you know, only about, and out of that, only 51% basically uh, reaches the Earth, uh, Earth's surface, right? And, and then, you know, so basically we are talking about a very small percentage of the energy, which is actually being utilized by the Earth, you know, to perform its function. And also, of course, to reflect back uh, to the atmosphere and then to be sensed by the uh, remote sensing, you know, uh, uh, platforms. So that's what I think, you know, very, very important to realize that not every bit of energy <coughs> which is coming from the sun is actually can be utilized. So the next question comes that, you know, before we understand the, you know, the, uh, the basics of remote sensing, uh, let's try to understand some terminology which are important in terms of radiation, you know, energy and so on. So you'll often hear these words. For example, the total radiant energy per second is typically referred as a radiant flux or power uh, in watts, obviously. And then we will also talk about spectral irradiance, which is basically a radiant energy per area per second. Now, many of you might be already aware of the black body radiation. And we know that everything on the Earth, you know, which is above zero degree Kelvin, can emit radiation. Right? Not obviously everything is not picked up by the remote sensing platform, but some you know can be, and there are ground-based remote sensing which we do as well. And there are some fundamental laws which control the black body radiation. And again, these are you know very fundamental physics which we uh, should know. Uh, you know, the first fundamental you know uh, point is that. The, the maximum wavelength at you know at which the peak of the radiation will occur is basically defined by the Wain's displacement law and this is a function of you know a by t uh, you know uh, and then the total power the total energy which is reaching the Earth's surface is again governed by the Stephens Boltzmann law which is a function of the you know the the sigma and the and the t is the temperature in in, in Kelvin and then there is a third law which basically you know, is called the Kirchhoff law, which, you know, talks about the spectral absorbity, which is equal to the, the spectral emissivity. You know, so basically the fundamental point is that 
any good absorber will also be a good emitter. You know, that's what your third law actually says. If you look to your right, you know, there is a very you know, uh, you know, good relationship between the wavelength and the spectral radiant which is being emitted. And, and this you know, wavelength, you know, this relationship is a function of, as you can see, very strongly a function of the, you know, the, you know, the wavelength. So black body, this is called a black body spectrum. And for sun, you, know, you can calculate the, you know, uh, what will be the you know, maximum wavelength or at which the peak in emission or you know, radius will be, will be occurring. And that is basically the uh, 600 Kelvin. And for Earth, you can see that it is basically uh, 300 K, for example, right? Now, the fundamental question we want to ask ourselves that can all the energy which is emitted from the electromagnetic you know, radiation source can be remotely sensed? You know, is the entire energy reaching the Earth's surface available for remote sensing? Is the entire electromagnetic spectra available for remote sensing? You know, we will answer this question in the next few slides. Okay, but this is how the you know the spectra, the black body spectra will look like, and you can see that for different you know temperatures, the spectra will be quite quite different. So let's first look at the uh, electromagnetic spectra. This is the total electromagnetic spectra we are looking at. Okay, and you can see that. It can start from gamma rays to X rays to ultraviolet, infrared, microwave, and then eventually to the radio wave. Out of that, you know, there is a very small range of the wavelength, which is called the visible, you know, wavelength, which is between 400 to about 750, uh, you know, nanometers, and that is the most useful range as far as remote sensing is concerned. And I'll, I'll, you know, I'll tell you why and and why why we consider that. But then. There are other, you know, wavelengths which are also used for very specific type of remote sensing, for example, microwave or infrared, uh, where some specific applications or some specific sensors are designed for very, very specific applications. So if you now look at the energy available for remote sensing, uh, this, you know, if you look to your uh, left hand you know, panel, uh, there is a diagram which shows how the uh, how the earth's you know energy intensity varies with reference to the wavelength okay so there are two spectra here one is a you know uh, emitted spectra and then you have the other you know uh, spectra as well in the in the lower diagram what you can see here that is the total energy intensity of the you know um, uh, radiation from the space which is coming in right but then if you look at the second diagram it actually shows you uh, the atmos atmospheric absorption. So out of the total energy which is coming from the sun, a lot of energy, all you see is the black, you know, black color or black shadowed regions that are actually absorbed by the atmosphere itself. And then you can see some you know, white portions there. These are the, you know, these are the regions where the absorption is minimal or almost nil. Okay. Now, these are actually what we call as atmospheric windows in terms of remote sensing. And you can see there is a, on the right-hand side diagram also, these atmospheric windows are very, you know, shown very, very clearly. You can also see at the bottom diagram to your left that there are, you know, these absorption, the total absorption which is happening out of the total electromagnetic spectra, there are you know, there are different components of the Earth's you know, Earth objects like water, carbon dioxide, methane, oxygen. They all have absorption you know, bands at different you know, wavelengths. And this is very interesting because then you know that what absorption bands are being created or, or what reflection you know, data set is available for different kinds of components. So, so basically, we know that what wavelengths will be absorbed you know, fully by water for example, and what wavelength will be reflected by the water. So, you know, so therefore, this is the fun, most fundamental uh, principle which is used to design the sensor for a particular application. So, for example, if there is a carbon dioxide a measurement mission, you know, born airborne, for example, you should know what you know in where in what wavelength you want to sense the energy because uh, all these you know yellow 
uh, areas of wavelength are the regions where no energy will pass through because they are basically completely being absorbed by carbon dioxide and so on. So this is the most fundamental principle here. And you can see that we have lots of you know, uh, uh, wavelengths available within the, uh, within the visible and infrared range, which can be used for a remote sensing. So therefore, you have ultraviolet visible range, uh, 0.3 to 0.75. Uh, near infrared range from 0.77 to 0.91, and then the short wave infrared range, middle infrared range, and microwave range as well. So these are you know, the major specific or major atmospheric windows where the energy emitted from the Earth is available for remote sensing. And then, of course, you can divide this you know, different you know, range, the entire range into specific, you know, sensors, specific bands, and then design your sensors accordingly. So that's the most fundamental point you should know about remote sensing data set. Then let's talk about what happens when these electromagnetic radiations in, you know, fall on the Earth's object and how do they interact? Now, these energy, when it is falling, uh, it is interacting in, a, in three different ways. You know, part of that is, of course, reflected, as I said. Part of that is absorbed. And then the part of that is transmitted. And this transmitted energy eventually will you know, come back as the emission as well, right? So these are the three different you know, uh, mechanisms or energy distribution, what is actually happening. So the, as far as the reflection is concerned, there are many things we should know, reflectance and albedo. Uh, now, the reflectance is a term which is basically defined for an interface of the two media, whereas the albedo is a term which is defined for the entire surface. For example, any surface which is highly reflective will also have a high albedo. Ice, for example, will have a very high albedo because almost all energy which is falling on ice is basically getting reflected. Water is a great absorber, and therefore, most of the energy which is falling in on water is getting absorbed except for a few wavelength changes and therefore water has a very poor reflectance basically you know so they are related terminology so all of these things basically will depend upon the nature of the surface and the physical environment they're also by the way a function of the wavelength involved and the local relief as i said water gets absorbed in most wavelengths but there are specific windows where it will reflect and therefore, you can sense that as well. The other thing is that you must also remember that, you know, Earth is also not a uniform surface, right? It is very uneven. And therefore, we also define different kinds of relief surfaces and on, on, on which the actual you know, reflection, you know, will, will depend upon. You know, the, the standard idealized reflection you must have read in your school physics is specular reflection, where incident energy is equal to the uh, reflectant energy and so on. Uh, then we define what is called as a Lambertian you know, reflection, where uh, part of the energy is getting scattered, you know, and, in, in all, you know, and then if it is a Lambertian you know, surface, it is, you know, it is scattered in, in all directions in the, in, the in, the, in the same way. But then most of the you know, Earth's surface doesn't have a Lambertian reflection surface, and therefore they have semi-diffuse reflection. And that is a property which we often use for identifying the different roughness of the Earth's surface and therefore uh, the different objects on the Earth's surface as well. Okay, then you, know, you also, uh, the final energy which is going to come to a sensor will also depend upon the viewing and the illuminating geometry, illuminating geometry, right? So you have sun here, you know, uh, and, uh, you know, uh, and, you know, so this is your sun, this is your, the energy where, from where the energy is coming from, uh, and that's your surface. You know, I just talked about different kinds of reflection which can come, and that's your sensor, right? So your sensor may be in different positions. So it is, if it is, you know, sensing the earth, you know, in a vertical direction, this is called another position. This is where, this is how most of the sensors are designed. So they will, you know, and then, you know, if the, if the platform is moving, it will, it will pick up all kinds of reflection which is coming from there. Sometimes we also use for very specific purposes, an inclined geometry, which is called a slant, you know, uh, radar uh, system. And there we, you know, whenever we want to enhance the, uh, the elevation or topography or roughness of the earth surface, we use, uh, inclined geometry of the surface, or sometimes we also use uh, uh, LIDAR, which is again a vertical 
you know, geometry as well. So all of these, you know, uh, things are important to understand uh, when you are dealing with the data, what kind of sensors are being used, what is the illumination geometry, and what is the viewing geometry as well, okay? Uh, so this is how the different kinds of sensor actually use. Okay, so the, you know, the important thing is that the, the resultant of all of that, the energy, you know, distribution, the reflection uh, mechanism, uh, the property which is, you know, which is there on the earth, they will define what is called as the spectral response curve, which is basically a relationship between the electromagnetic radiation and the wavelength. Okay, and I will show you several spectral forms, you know, uh, response curves in, uh, in the next few slides. And, and this spectral response curve is basically what is defined as a spectral signature. Okay, so it is not a single, you know, typically when we want to identify a particular object, you know, on the remote sensing data, it is never a single feature. It is not a, never a single absorption or reflection peak. We actually depend on I know multiple you know features that is why they are called spectral signatures and all the objects on the earth rock mineral atoms water vegetation they all have very very different spectral signatures and that is again the most fundamental basis on which the remote sensing data are actually acquired and and analyzed okay so therefore you know in most of the time we are basically are uh, trying to understand the interaction of the with the with the, the electromagnetic spectra and how the you know the the these are interacting and how they are generating a very specific uh, you know uh, signature. So again, the two fundamental questions: Can we differentiate the different objects on Earth's surface from their spectral signatures? Yes, I will show you that. And if yes, what wavelength, what patterns, and what sensors are suitable for? For, for identifying and for mapping the specific objects on the Earth's surface. So let's look at that. Now, this is one of the most fundamental, you know, curve, you know, which is shu, which is used by uh, remote sensors to, to, to demonstrate why remote sensing is such a powerful technique, you know, to identify that. So what is shown here is basically a relationship between wavelength and the reflectance in terms of percentage. And what you see here are different curves, you know, in different colors, which are actually the spectral curves of the Earth's material. So what you see here that how the different objects of on the Earth, like water, vegetation, uh, dry soil or limonite, which is a soil type, uh, are responding to, uh, you know, in different you know, wavelengths. You can see water, for example, you know. Uh, so this water, you know, only has a reflectance in a very, very short wavelength, okay? And then in the rest, rest of the other, you know, wavelength area, it is absorbed. So it, it has no signature at all, okay? Vegetation has a very interesting, uh, you know, signal. It has many peaks and many, you know, many dips. For example, all the low values here, these are basically the absorption bands, and these are uh, peaks, which are basically your, your reflection bands here. So these are, again, absorption bands here, for example, and so on, okay? Similarly, you know, you can see that there are absorption bands here for limonite, dry soil has a spectral signature, and so on. So this is a very, you know, broad curve, and just to demonstrate that every, every you know, different type of water Will be or different type of objects on the Earth's surface will respond differently. So we can see that the clear water, which is shown here like this, has a very different signal from the turbid water, which is shown here, for example, right? So turbid water, you can see that the reflectance increases because of the presence of the suspended matter in the, in the water. And therefore, not all the energy which is falling on the water is absorbed. And therefore, a large, I mean, a much larger part will be, will be reflected back. And therefore, it will generate a very different spectral signature, for example. Now, let's look at, you know, I mean, I realize that many of you are agricultural scientists. So let's look at the vegetation spectra in detail. Uh, vegetation is one of the most, you know, uh, widely mapped uh, feature, uh, you know, through remote sensing data. And it has multiple applications in uh, forestry, agriculture, and in many other uh, areas. 
So vegetation has a very, very interesting signature and its signature is very different in different wavelengths, in visible range, in near infrared range, and in the short, you know, short wave infrared range as well. And so you can see this green curve actually is the very typical uh, you know, spectral signature of a healthy vegetation, as we call it. And, and there are different parts of the curve which are manifestations of different structures or different processes which are, you know, or I would say different kinds of interaction of the vegetation with the electromagnetic spectra. For example, we can see two very interesting absorption bands here. These are happening in the visible range and they are generally related to leaf pigments. So therefore, if the leaf pigments are uh, green or, 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 or red or any other color, uh, they will have different you know, bands, different absorption bands, or they will shift the, you know, the bands. So a typical uh, you know, healthy vegetation has a green reflectant or green pigment, and therefore they will have these two very interesting leaf pigments here. Then we have a very high value of uh, you know, spectral uh, reflectance in the near infrared range, and that is because of the cell structure. And again, this is called the uh, this is called the uh, near infrared plateau. And this rise, you know, from here to here is basically called the red edge because there is a very sharp change in the vegetation spectral a spectral curve when you move from the visible range to the near infrared range. And that's a very very you know unique signature of the healthy vegetation. And then again, you see some absorption bands here, which are typically related to water. And again, there are much larger absorption bands here, uh, which are related to the water component here as well. Okay, so there are three parts of the curve: you know, visible, near infrared range, and the short wave infrared region. And you can see that all of the three parts are related to different processes or different components of the vegetation. The first component is related to leaf pigments. The second one is related to cell structure. And the third component is related to the water content, as well as some other you know, biochemicals like protein lignin, for example, or cellular structures and so on. So there are you know, very, you know, very detailed studies people have done uh, on the vegetation you know, spectra uh, related to uh, these kind of response curves as well. Just to you know, illustrate you know, this a bit more, there is a very standard vegetation index which we use to map the healthy vegetation and to differentiate it from the so-called unhealthy vegetation is to take a ratio between the NIR band and the visible band because this is a very high value here. So if you take the ratio between NRI band and the visible range, you will get a very high value for the healthy vegetation or dense vegetation. So it is related to vegetation density as well and, uh, and a low, slightly lower value for the lower uh, for the lower vegetation density or for poor vegetation as well and then we use you know various kinds of other digital image processing to further classify the data for example so similarly if you see uh, you know the spectral response curve curves the green vegetation has a slightly different curve than dry vegetation uh, compared to the soil for example if you also see how the leaf pigments will uh, will will make the spectral curve very different the green uh, leaf will have this curve the red leaf will have this curve, the white leaf will have this curve. Similarly, the vegetation type, which is different, uh, for example, grass or birch or pine, fir, they will all have very, very different you know, spectral curve, for example. So these are some of the you know, very fundamental you know, principles which have been generated, of course, from experimental data, and then to map the uh, you know, vegetation uh, type, density, and also sometimes the, uh, you know, the, uh, the contamination in the uh, in the in the vegetation, for example, there is a very interesting shift, uh, which is called a blue, you know, shift of the red edge. You know, remember I defined this thing as a as a red edge, and if you have a vegetation which is growing on a, a you know a contaminated or a soil, for example, a sulfide rich soil, for example, then the this this red edge will shift towards the blue region, for example, and this so you can see that. This is, there's a background line, and then there is a, a shift of that as well. There's a very minor shift, but people have used this kind of a shift, you know, to identify the vegetation response, uh, you know, in terms of the geochemical stress, for example. So there are lots and lots of these studies which have been done to identify the, you know, vegetation response to geochemical stress or different soil type or, you know, variability in the vegetation health, for example, and so on. Okay. 
Now let's move, you know, uh, to uh, the uh, remote sensing platforms and sensors. So what we have now understood that uh, there are different kinds of response which the Earth's object will generate, the water, ice, uh, vegetation, et cetera. But now the fundamental point is that how do we sense this? What are, where are our platforms and what kind of data set we are looking at, for example, right? Now, when I say something as remote sensing platform, uh, we typically talk about three different platforms. Ground-based platforms, there are remote sensing data which are collected from the ground, uh, which can be done in short range systems of 50 to 100 meters you know, elevation, medium range system to 150 to 200 meters elevation, and then long range system, which can go up to about one kilometer, for example. There are airborne you know, platforms like balloons, for example, and then of course there are space-borne platforms. We'll talk about this you know, in more detail. Again, a space platform, space platforms can be located at different elevations, ranging from less than 2,000 kilometers, which are called low Earth orbit, uh, 2,000 to something like 35,000 kilometers, that is medium Earth you know, orbit, and then there are high Earth orbit, which are called, which are more than 35,000 know, kilometers and so on. So let's look at these. So these are some examples of the ground-based platforms. Uh, you know, you have, you know, mobile hydraulic platforms, which can be uh, which can be handled up to 15 meters height, for example, and they can collect uh, specific data in terms of sensor. There are portable masts, which are again, uh, can be stationed at a given place for a given time, uh, but they can be very, very, very unstable in wind conditions. And then there are fixed towers, which are which have a much higher rigidity than the mass. And they collect data. These are typically used for various kinds of measurements in terms of the atmospheric you know, parameters like wind-related parameters, precipitation sensors, uh, the, the radiation sensor, there are temperature. So a lot and lot of hydrological data, hydrometeorological data is collected uh, through this kind of data sets. Okay. Uh, then, you know, this is how a tower will look like, for example, in a fixed tower. And these are, uh, uh, they are located at various places and there are, are lots of hydrometeorological sensors which are attached to these platforms as well. So these are also by the way remote sensing, you know, some kind of a remote sensing here. Then there are ground-based platforms like weather surveillance, radar, radar. I know all these, these are again fixed stations, but they are, you know, used for weather surveillance. For example, they can track and detect the, the typhoons and cloud masses. They are again, so data is basically being sensed and then they are sent to, uh, you know, the ground stations and then they are being analyzed. There are airborne platforms like balloons, for example, which are flown at uh, altitudes of 22 to 14, 40 kilometers. They are basically, again, mostly used for atmospheric sensors. There are very uh, important instruments which are attached to these, you know, balloons, and then they collect data for a definite time period, and then they bring back the data. There are radio sonde, which are, again, measuring atmospheric parameters like pressure, temperature, uh, relative humidity, etc., and so on. And then there are wind sandals, red wind sand of Sunday, for example. Again, there are you know uh, different kinds of sensors which are using, which are being used. Again, they can be attached to uh, you know airborne platforms as well, like air, you know, by like aircraft, for example, or or our balloons and so on. So the the there are lots of advantages of the airborne platform because they provide data in high spatial resolution. They can provide data in, you know, in resolutions of 20 centimeters or less. Uh, they, apart from the atmospheric sensing, a lot of airborne sensing is used for generating uh, you know, the spatial data, like aerial photograph, for example. You know, in, in good old days, uh, this was the only, uh, before the satellite era came, uh, this was the only way of doing some kind of a remote sensing and so on. Uh, they can be very easily uh, maneuvered. They can change their schedule, uh, you know, because if you have weather information, you can replan, re et cetera, and so on. The sensor maintenance and cell repair is basically easy, and therefore, you know, it can be maintained quite easily and so on. The, there are disadvantages because sometimes you have to, and uh, you need permission to, you know, intrude in the foreign airspace. Uh, you need a lot of passes to cover a large area because these are the field of view which is provided from the aircraft is much smaller and you know the SWAT is much less compared to the satellites and therefore the, there is a very high cost of data acquisition per unit of area. Okay? 
So, you know, so therefore, you know, there are lots of airborne platforms like, you know, the, the aircraft which are used. Nowadays, we also use a lot of drones, for example, the, uh, in the, on the you know, unmanned aerial vehicles, which can also be, you know, used for uh, aerial data collection. We use a lot of sensors, uh, single band cameras or multispectral cameras. Uh, we also use a lot of hyperspectral cameras. So depending upon the purpose, you can generate a lot of you know, data, whether you need a, a optical range data or a, or a multispectral data or a hyperspectral data, you can mount these sensors on aircrafts or on UV and then collect very, very high resolution data. But as I said, the disadvantage is that they cover large, smaller areas and the data acquisition cost is very high. But the advantage is they can provide very, very high resolution data. So it depends upon the purpose. Then, of course, the most common platform which we often use for remote sensing data sets are space-bound platforms. They're mounted on a spacecraft, they're launched from a ground station, and then they go and stay in the space for many, many years. And as I said, depending upon the height of the satellite, you can divide them into low, lower Earth orbit, medium Earth orbit, and high Earth orbit. So satellite data can cover very large areas, and they can, and because they're rotating you know, around the Earth, you know, for a certain frequency, they can provide repetitive coverage of the same area of interest multiple times in a month or in a year, for example, right? And these are some, there are many hundreds and thousands of satellites now which have been launched uh, from different parts of the of the country, uh, different parts of the world. And they are now, you know, they have provided very, very valuable, you know, data sets. We'll go through some of these, you know, missions in, in the next few slides, but there are plenty of uh, literature available on on this. So these are you know very large you know data sets which are being provided here. Okay, so let's look at what are the advantages of different types of orbits uh, which which they have. So low Earth orbit satellites they are typically polar orbiting satellites. They are passing above the Earth poles. They are they provide you know pretty high resolution of the Earth you know imaging and they cross the equator at ninety degrees. So these are typical you know, characteristics of the low Earth orbit. The advantage is that, you know, uh, every time the satellite views a new segment of the Earth because of the Earth's rotation. So, you know, you remember that, you know, the Earth is also rotating. So the, the, the orbit of the satellite is fixed, but the Earth is rotating. So therefore, because of the rotation of the Earth, you are getting different parts of the Earth getting imaged at different times, right? That's basically, but it's at a uh, slightly lower height, so you can get a reasonably good resolution of the data from here. Then, you know, we also talk about how, you know, depending upon the position of the orbit and the, and the satellite uh, and the Earth, we define something as a sun synchronous orbit, where the angle of the inclination of the orbit with respect to the sun throughout the year is the same. Okay. which means that the satellite will cross the equator precisely at the same you know local sun time which is very good because you know that the you know the when you are comparing the data from one time to another you don't want the illumination condition to change and therefore this is the most useful type of satellite for remote sensing application because the illumination condition at a given time at a given place is going to be very very similar uh, we also we also have something called a near polar orbit where the orbital plane is inclined a slightly a slight small angle with respect to the Earth's uh, rotational axis and there are certain you know uh, advantages of that as well. Then we use you know the high orbits you know high Earth orbits uh, satellites where we have two types: uh, geosynchronous orbit and the geostationary orbit. Now geosynchronous orbit you know is, is satellites are designed in such a way that the orbital period of the Earth is synchronized with the rotation period of the Earth, which means that you know it will it will basically uh, be literally focusing on the same point you know of the Earth all most of the time, right? So this period is basically you know so basically if you consider the height of these satellites, this period is equal to about one sidereal day, which is about twenty three hours you know uh, fifty six minutes, and it's almost like a twenty four hours a day. So in the, the same time. So, you know, the, the, uh, the Earth is orbiting and the satellite is orbiting at the same kind of a speed here, okay? So it's called geosynchronous orbit, basically. Then we have a geostationary orbit, which is a special case of the geosynchronous orbit. Uh, and here, the orbit is actually slightly circular than the, uh, you know, compared to the geosynchronous orbit, uh, which is slightly elliptical as well. So now, you know, what happens that 
the satellite will appear stationary with respect to the uh, you know, Earth over the equator. And these are the ideal orbits for the communication satellites because you know, you know when you want to use your mobile or any communication service, you don't want to lose the connection with the satellite. And that is why you need that position to be fixed as well. So these are called geostationary orbit because it is rotating almost at the same speed at, as, the, as the Earth as well. So that is how these satellites are being designed. Now, the choice of the orbit, as, I, as is very obvious, is dependent on its mission. Okay? Uh, there are most of the remote sensing satellites, which we will talk about, are placed in the low Earth orbit because we need, uh, typically need high resolution. But then the commercial satellites or communication satellites are, you know, they, they are located in the HEO because it should receive and send signals from the large geographical area. Okay, they need to be powerful, but they also need to cover a much larger area to give you a wider coverage as well. So all communication satellites are generally placed in HEO, and all remote sensing satellites are placed in the LEO. And that's how we decide that. Okay, now let's talk about the sensors. What are the sensors which are actually available to us, you know, uh, for our remote sensing purposes? Now, sensor is a very generic word. You know, these are uh, actually any any kind of, you know, even the small thermometer which you use to, to measure your body temperature is actually a sensor, okay? So there are any, any device which is, which can be used to detect and respond, you know, to some change, electrical or optical, for example. You know, a camera which you use to, uh, to take a photograph is also a sensor. The flashlight which you use uh, to take a photo in, a, in, in, in the dark is also a sensor. All of these are sensors, right? So what the sensor is doing that it is converting a physical parameter into a signal, a quantitative parameter many times, which can be measured electrically or optically, for example. Now, in terms of remote sensing, we have just seen that how the electromagnetic radiation energy is available for sensing. So these sensors are actually converting these electromagnetic signal, signals into, into, you know, into some sort of a image, you know, and which you can see, observe, and, and then process. So we typically use two types of sensors, passive and active, which is very analogous to your camera without a flash and camera with a flash. A camera with a, without a flash is a passive sensor. It is using the energy available uh, you know, uh, which is reflected from the object and an active sensor is energy, sending the energy and then sensing it back, for example, right? That's basically the difference here. So we'll, now we also will talk about the different kinds of resolution. We often uh, are familiar with the spatial resolution. You know, we, you know, you, uh, in, nowadays everybody uses mobile. So you all are aware of the uh, 600 DPI or 2000 DPI or 4000 DPI image which your mobile you know, camera can generate. So these are typically spatial resolution we talk about, which are how, how sharp your image can be and how, you know, at what you know, interval in terms of space, the data is being collected. So that's basically a spatial resolution. I'll talk about more about that. Then there are spectral resolution. There are also a radiometric resolution of a sensor. And then there are temporal resolution, time, at what time the data is being repeated. So let's talk about that also in the next few slides. Now, the first thing, as I said, there are active sensors and there are passive sensors. And I give you an example of active sensor and passive sensors as well, where passive energy is being used and where active energy is being used. Now, there's a very, 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 very you know, compli complex classification of these sensors as well. You know, Passive and active sensors are two broad categories which you can see here, but then there are many other types. There are scanning type, there are non-scanning type, there are imaging type, there are non-imaging type. So imaging type and non-imaging type mean that some sensors will create an image, uh, you know, which you can process. Some sensors will not create an image, but they will generate data. For example, uh, you know, a spectrometer, they will generate a spectral curve or a data. They will generate some kind of a gravity data, for example. You know, camera, any kind of a camera is an imaging sensor because they will generate an image, for example. So likewise, you know, there are, again, in the active you know, range as well, there are non-imaging type of sensors and also there are, you know, imaging type of sensors as well. And the basic difference is whether they are generating image or whether they're generating special, you know, data to, to be processed, for example, okay? Now, <clears throat> 
So as, as I said, there are non-scanning, non-imaging sensors, for example. They are not forming images. They are basically recording some kind of a spectral quantity or parameter as a function of time, for example, temperature. And most of the atmospheric sensors are basically non-scanning, non-imaging sensors. Okay, there are non-scanning imaging sensors. They are, they are actually measuring you know, uh, the radiation coming from the entire scene at once. For example, our eyes, our camera, there are basically non-scanning but imaging sensors as well. So you should understand the difference between the two because you, you and we use again different kinds of processing methods and techniques to process the data sets coming from here. Then there are scanning sensors, you know, uh, and among the scanning sensor, there is one type which is called a long track scanners. So here, the you know you can see that the flight direction is here, okay, and the scanning direction is also you know in the same direction. So basically, scanning is done in the same direction as the flight, okay. So the flight is moving and the scanning is also done in the same direction here. So image is acquired line by line, for example, right? Then there are a cross track scanners where the flight direction and the scanning directions are perpendicular to each other. And here, the image is acquired pixel by pixel. Okay, so these are typically, uh, you know, all high resolution scanners are, you know, uh, getting data pixel by pixel. Okay, so both types of scanners are used for, for different kinds of sensors, depending upon the purpose and depending upon the data set which are actually being utilized. Now, let's talk about the resolution part of it, spatial resolution. Now, spatial resolution primarily refers to the size of the smallest possible object which you can detect on your image, okay? And this will primarily depend upon what is called as instantaneous field of view, the IFOV of the sensor, which is what is shown here. That's your, you know, IF, IFOV, okay? And obviously it will be a function of the height, you know, at what height your sensor is actually, you know, sitting. Because as you, as you increase the height, your, uh, your your resolution will basically decrease, right? So pixel size is you know is you know is basically the spatial resolution is defined in terms of the pixel size. So let's say uh, a you have a pixel size of thirty meter by thirty meter, which means any object which is less than thirty meter will not be able to be identified on a on a on a on a on, on this resolution. If your pixel size is five by five meter. Uh, you know, or if your pixel size is one by one meter, you can actually display that, you know. So therefore, you know, pixel size will define how, you know, how small or how big object can be basically, you know, can be determined or can be determined, can be, you know, can be identified on the object here. So again, it will depend upon the purpose. If you're trying to map a whole forest, obviously you don't need a you know, a one meter resolution data, because remember one thing that high resolution also means high volume of data and therefore a high processing time and high, high resources, you know, to process that data as well, right? So therefore, purpose of, but if you want to map each and every building, for example, in a campus, then you need a much high resolution data as well. Uh, if you want to map, uh, you know, each and every a pollutant which is coming into a river, then also you need high resolution data and so on. So the choice of the data and the choice of the resolution depends upon your purpose and the project as well. But here is a difference. So you can see, you know, that's uh, one satellite data which has a 30 meter resolution. Okay, you can't see much here. In a, another resolution is 23.5 meter resolution. Again, you can't see much of the same area. Uh, you can see a 5.8 meter resolution data of the same area here, and you can start seeing some objects up here. But if you are looking at a one meter resolution data, you can literally see everything. You can see a road, you can see you know, different crossroads, you can see you know, houses, you can see the red color is basically vegetation areas, you know, they're agricultural plots. So you can literally see everything here, right? So again, depending upon the purpose, your resolution will be different and for different purposes here. Then what is referred as a spectral resolution, which is, you know, how, you know, how the very, very fine wavelength, you know, is how the entire wavelength available is divided into, you know, very, very fine wavelength ranges, which are also called bands. Okay. So, you know, uh, so larger is the number of bands, larger or smaller is the wavelength range, 
uh, which you can detect from a sensor is basically going to define the spectral resolution of the data. So a four band data is a low resolution data, uh, a 50 band data is a high resolution data, for example, right? So a simple panchromatic data may have just you know one band data, multispectral data may have four or five band data, and hyperspectral you know, band data may have 200 channels or 200 bands to actually to detect that kind of a data, for example. Again, you know, spectral resolution, uh, panchromatic data is a single band, you know, data, pan data, multispectral that allows you to see things, for example, uh, but a multispectral data allows you to also identify things as well, because you can now see the signal of signals of different objects, you know, water, vegetation, houses, and so on. So that is the advantage of the multispectral data as well. Then we call something as a radiometric resolution, and that is the resolution which describes the ability of the sensor to discriminate very, very subtle differences in the energy, which is being sensed by the remote sensor. So basically it will, it defines, it is defined by the number of brightness level, which a particular sensor can detect, okay? So, you know, we typically define this as a seven bit data or eight bit data or a nine bit data or a, a 10 bit data, for example. Okay, so so a nine, seven bit data is basically where the, the grayscale will be from one to one twenty seven, zero to one twenty seven. Eight bit data will be zero to twenty four, two fifty five, and a ten bit data will be zero to one zero two three, for example. Okay, so the number of channels, you know, number of bits which are available here is much more. So you can also understand in terms of the bit depth. So for example, the amount of detail in each pixel is basically what is called the bit depth. So in a four bit data, you have two to the power four, which means you can detect 16 colors. In an eight bit data, which means two to the power eight, you can actually detect 256 colors, right? So that is basically, so if you have a higher resolution of radiometric resolution, high, high radiometric resolution, you can actually distinguish very subtle differences in the colors as well. So you can see, for example, here, uh, the upper image is an eight bit data, uh, you know, where you can see very subtle differences in the in the river, you know, in the in the water as well. It's a coastal area, whereas in the four bit data, you don't see the image is getting blurred. You know, it's much less sharper. And also the differentiation among different colors here in terms of buildings or in terms of other features is basically, you know, very, 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 very subtle here example and so on. So it provides, a, you know, a much larger depth, bit depth, and therefore allows you to distinguish very, very subtle features as well. Okay, again, an example of a, you know, radiometric resolution, uh, a Landsat, you know, data, vis-a-vis uh, -vis a Landsat 8 data, you know, so uh, thematic data had a 255, 256 scale data uh, compared to 65,000 you know, scale data, for example, here. You can see the difference, you know. Uh, this resolution, everything is getting blurred, where a Landsat data is showing all kinds of different colors here. You can see the sharpness, you know, is very different. You can see different depths of water, for example. You can see different uh, types of uh, vegetation cover, you know, for example, here and so on. So there are differences, you know, there are resolution differences which matter, for example. Then finally, we also talk about the temporal resolution, which means at what frequency the data is being collected. You know, every time, at what frequency the same satellite will visit the same area, and therefore you can measure and map the dynamics of the you know, Earth system, you know, water, forest cover, plant, floods, anytime, anytime any, any uh, project which needs the frequency, the frequent data set recording, that is what can be done here. Let me very quickly run through the different missions which we have. I'm running out of time a little bit, but uh, you know, one of the oldest and one of the most widely used mission is the Landsat mission, which was launched by the Americans. And there are eight missions already from one to eight. You can read you know, the, uh, the details a bit later, but this was one of the most you know, extensive data, which is still available for our use. Uh, you know, from different times. So again, there are different years, 1972 to 2013, and there are different, every time they launched a new satellite, they also had, you know, improvement in terms of the satellites, in terms of the spatial and, uh, and radiometric resolution and everything else. This is one of the oldest and a very widely available data set. SPOT mission is a French mission, uh, which provided a very high resolution data, close to about 20 meters to 10 meters uh, data in both 
uh, panchromatic you know band as well as multispectral data again uh, you know this has continued and this is going to continue until again a new mission is being launched in 2024 but data is being being collected you know uh, we have had a very interesting and a very uh, you know wide ranging indian satellite program the indian remote sensing program we started way back in 2013 and we just continued you know even today so from 13 to 15 you know 2005 we have launched many many satellites which are uh, and you can see these are just a few which are listed here but there is a huge range of satellites which have been launched by the isro and the and the and the sac you know people and again for different purposes uh, different resolution different uh, projects sometimes they're focused on agriculture sometimes they're focused on water sometimes they're focused on ocean applications and so on the sentinel mission again is a very powerful mission which is a european space science space mission uh sentinel one and sentinel two uh the interesting part of this mission is that they are providing the uh data in both optical range as well as the uh, you know the uh, the, uh, uh, the the radar range. You know, uh, and therefore they provide you know very uh, you know very good observational data for uh, application for vegetation, soil, and coastal ranges. Uh, Sentinel two has thirteen band data. They provide data in about ten to sixteen resolution, depending upon the band, etc., and so on. So there are multiple satellites available here. Uh, the SRTM mission is a is a mission which was launched. To collect topographic data, you know, so uh, you know the the entire Earth's topography has been mapped using this data. This mission is now discontinued, but the data is available uh, for the period of 2000, and you can actually analyze the topographic data of Earth at resolutions of about 90 meters or 30 meters, depending upon two sets of data, uh, and these are really nice data sets here again. Uh, so, as spacing, as, as I said, uh, the original data is 30 meter by 30 meter. But for the entire data, uh, entire world, they have resampled it to 90 by 90 meter to reduce the storage and all of that. These are basically radar data sets which are, you know, collecting uh, topographic data. So you can you can see all of this topographic differentiation of the Earth is quite possible using this kind of a data sets here. Or mountains, you know, uh, valleys, uh, glaciers, all of them can be matched, mapped from here uh, very very nicely. A new uh, and a very high resolution topographic data is now available, which is called Tandem X. This is not a free data. It is a German observation satellite, but they provide data at a very high resolution of one meter. Uh, you know, for academic use, uh, limited data sets can be obtained from these people, but for larger area, for commercial application, you have to buy uh, this data. But these are really, really nice, very high resolution remote sensing data for topographic missions. So again, I have listed some of these uh, remote sensing open source data platform, which you can explore uh, you know, later. Uh, there are websites given, you can explore these websites and then see what kind of data sets is available. A lot of data, by the way, is now available free, free of cost, but some specialized and hydrogen data you have to buy. Uh, you know, again, again, I have provided some information on uh, the open source data platform, which you can explore more. I've also provided a lot of you know free uh, and commercial uh, software bundles. We use uh, Eridas Imagine, NV, RGIS, kind of a sulfur. All of these data sets are used for image processing. Uh, most of them are commercial software, that they are, but then there are also open source uh, software bundles which you can use like Google Earth is a very good now. Uh, you know, you can see a lot of temporal data sets. There's now also Google Earth Engine, which you can analyze the data sets on that. There is a QGIS platform, which is again free uh, for use for many, many, uh, in for many, many applications. Grass is again an open source software bundle, which you can use, et cetera, and so on. To summarize, therefore, you know, uh, you know, we have learned that the energy which is available for remote sensing is a function of the interaction of the electromagnetic radiation with the atmosphere. There are various phenomena which are happening, scattering, absorption, and transmission. And the net, you know, uh, you know, signal is basically being picked up by the remote sensing sensors here. We have also learned that the different objects on the Earth have different uh, spectral curve, and that allows us to distinguish you know, uh, their presence, their dynamics, and their characteristics. 
Uh, the data are available at various spatial, radiometric, and temporal resolution. Uh, the choice of data and, and the resolution will depend upon your applications. There are multiple softwares. Not everything uh, you can buy or should buy. There are lots and lots of data available now on, on an open source uh, data sets, both data as well as the software bundles. So feel free to use it. I can, I'm happy to provide, uh, you know, the lecture notes or whatever form uh, the organizers want, but, uh, and I'm also happy to take a few questions if you have. Thank you so much for attention. And I'm sorry, Anko, that I probably have run a little bit, you know, uh, out of time, but uh, I'm done now. Nahin, I'm, nahin, not... sir, nahin, badiya <laughs> I'm happy to take questions now. जी रोहित जी आप ज्योति को पोस्ट बनाइए और चैट बॉक्स को ऑन करिए जिससे पार्टिसिपेंट्स अपनी क्वेरी पूछ सके ओके सर नाउ सो दैट आई कैन इंटरैक्ट बेटर चैट बॉक्स ऑन हो रहा है सर चैट बॉक्स पर पार्टिसिपेंट्स अपनी क्वेरीज लिखते हैं ओके जी सर दिस इज द बेस्ट प्रेजेंटेशन आई हैव एवर हियर्ड थैंक यू Yes, I, I let me start answering. Uh, the first question is drones are emerging in the agricultural sector. Yes, I do use a lot of drones and I have quite a few projects which are related to agriculture sector. So we, uh, we can use many, many sensors. Multispectral sensors are being used for, um, you know, for understanding and mapping the vegetation health. We are using thermal infrared sensing for uh, you know, doing crop water stress uh, assessment. Uh, and uh, we are also using hyperspectral remote sensing for mapping uh, soil nutrients. So there are many, many applications in agriculture sector. Is, I would think that this is one of the largest application sector and perhaps the most useful from a societal relevance point of view as well. So yeah, very good question. Uh, okay, I have another, how can we use in real time agriculture? Uh, well, there are, you know, some real time sensors in the, it is not exactly real time, but the, as I said, you can actually uh, use the, the temporal data sets from drone, for example, and then model it, and then eventually use that for prediction. So that's not real time, but basically we are using it for predicting the, uh, you know, the crop water health or or crop water stress, for example, for uh, different sensor. But then there are also, by the way, uh, sensors which are installed in the in the soil or in the in the you know but they are also in some in some sort of remote sensing but you know uh, not exactly from the air or from space but they are ground remote sensing so we have for example an agricultural field here where we have installed sensors which is measuring the temperature uh, and the soil moisture uh, continuously at every 15 minutes we get data in our server and then we analyze that. So that is almost like a real real time remote sensing as well. Uh, relationship between reflectance and albedo. Yes, see, uh, they're practically the same thing, except that when you define a reflectance, you define reflectance with reference to a surface, with reference to a media, okay? Uh, so there's a, you know, you know, so there is a reflectance which is dependent on the media. Uh, but then albedo is defined for the whole surface, like water, uh, like uh, like ice, for example, and so on. Okay, and so albedo is basically the percent reflectance uh, divided by the total total incident energy. That's all. So it's the same thing, but it, it is the context which is different here. Right? Okay. Uh, in the graph of vegetation, you said that represent the healthy vegetation. Now, how can we conclude it? Okay. So this is because, you know, uh, the healthy vegetation responds in a different way. It has a, it has a very high reflectance in the uh, near infrared region, right? So if the, if the vegetation is not healthy, uh, because it has a, it has a very high chlorophyll content. So it's a function of chlorophyll content. So healthy vegetation is also green and therefore the green reflectance is very, very high. But if the vegetation is not healthy, if, for example, there's a phenomenon called senescence, you know, the yellowing of the vegetation, for example. Now, during that time, the green reflectance will decrease and therefore the reflectance curve will get modified. So if you have two, you know, curves from the same area, a healthy vegetation can be distinguished from the unhealthy vegetation, for example. That's how we distinguish it, for example, right? Uh, 
Okay, uh, very nice session. Uh, some tools which are a farmer. Uh, yeah, I mean, tools, as I said, at, at that scale of 20 to 20 acre scale, uh, you can only uh, use the drone based, you know, agricultural system. So, by the way, you should also know that, uh, you know, India is now making thousands and thousands of agricultural drones, for example. And they are not just, you know, being used or will be used for sensing. They're also being used for many other agricultural applications, for example, spreading of the uh, pesticides or spreading of the uh, fertilizers and so on. So a lot of publications are coming up, you know, for, for that kind of applications, uh, which is, you know, which is, so it is a huge industry which is coming up now in terms of the uh, drone-based uh, agricultural applications, et cetera, and so on. Okay. Um, some people are asking for internship. Yes, you can contact me uh, as and again. Uh, we have opportunity, we will provide you. Uh, different between spectral resolution and spatial resolution. Yeah, the spectral resolution is, uh, you know, is, 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 is referring to how many bands you have, okay, in terms of uh, detecting the signal. The spatial resolution is how big an object you can detect on your satellite image. For example, can you detect a house or can you detect a town? Okay, so to, de to detect a house, you need a very, very, for example, a house is only going to be 10, 20 meters of size, right? So you need a, you need a sensor which has a resolution which is lesser than the size of the object, which means you need a resolution of, you know, let's say uh, one or five meters, right? That's your spatial resolution. The spectral resolution is, that how many wavelengths, uh, you know, so any sensor will have different bands, right? You know, so, and the data is being collected in different bands. It's like a radio channel, you know, a good radio will have 50, you know, channels. Uh, for example, a good satellite dish will have 200 channels. If you have a lower package, you will have 50 channels, right? So the lower channel will only give you 50, you know, channels. A higher, higher, you know, uh, a subscription will give you 200 channels. It's like that's basically a radio material resolution here, right? That's what it is. Okay. Um, is there any sense in the market, especially for disease related? Uh, disease related, I'm not aware of, but uh, what is done is, is, is done in a remote, you know, remote, these are all remotely sensed, uh, you know, signals. So you have to find a proxy. See, see anything which you are measuring from a remote sensing data is not, a direct measurement. You know, you are measuring them as a proxy, okay? So you have to find a proxy. For example, if a, if a disease is affecting a vegetation uh, or a forest, then, uh, then you can map that, you know, area in terms of how the vegetation is to respond in terms of the disease effect, for example, right? So that's how it is, it is actually being done, uh, not directly, for example. So, yeah, same thing stands for the crop disease or pest and so on. So whatever, you know, impact any particular process is, is, is making on a system, that can be measured and assessed if you have a repeated coverage of that, you know, session, for example. Okay. Uh, as I managing a 300 hectare cereal so I can efficient weed and crop vegetation through sensors, I'm using NDVI, but I can't separate weed and crop data. Uh, yes, you can use NDVI, but not obviously from satellite. You know, to differentiate the uh, weed and crop, uh, you need the high resolution data, particularly from the drone data sets. Otherwise, from satellite based data, because as I said, the best satellite data will, you know, can, I mean, which are freely available are still about 30 meter resolution, right? Uh, so they are not good enough to distinguish the crop you know, and the wheat, for example. But, and, and just to tell you, uh, the satellite-based data may have a 30-meter resolution, whereas a drone-based data can give you a 5-centimeter resolution of data. So obviously, 5-centimeter resolution of data you need to distinguish the, uh, the wheat and the crop, for example. Yes, it's possible technologically, but it needs a different tool, and, and, and for example. Uh, remote sensing image sensing in the case of weather, I have already described that. There are lots of atmospheric remote sensing which are uh, being used for uh, 
uh, collecting a lot of data in terms of you know cloud all the weather data which you they would which you hear is all coming from remote sensing only as etc so there is a huge you know application of remote sensing data in terms of atmospheric prediction and uh, you know and uh, you know and and uh, an analysis for example uh, new trend analysis as i said before uh, yes it's possible to do it uh, using uh, you know some remote sensing data there are both but then again you need a very high resolution you know in terms of radiometric data so for example what what have why it is needed see what happens is that you know some uh, signals are available only in a very very narrow wavelength okay so let's say uh, one signal is available at 1.567 uh, micrometers okay so you need to have that you know very thin very thin band of data to be able to distinguish that otherwise your signal will be diffused and you won't be able to uh, you know uh, to uh, to differentiate that Sudden change in climatic conditions. Yes, these are again a part of the weather forecasting uh, data. Uh, sensors present in the spectrophotometer. Uh, spectrophotometers are working on a different principle. Uh, ASFP, they're all uh, different sensors. They are not uh, used for remote sensing. They are basically used for uh, ground measurements, for example. Uh, soil health and nutrient content I have already described. Uh, so I think I've answered uh, most of the questions so far. So Ankur, over to you. Ah, uh, sir, jata tha chiye apne clear kar diye hain. Kuch bachay nahi. PPT apne apne ek self explanatory thi. Kuch participants ye keh rahe hain ki kya hamen PPT mil sakti hai. Hamne aisi PPT nahi di. I am happy to share that. You tell me. I can make a. I mean the. I can make a PDF and uh, send it to you or keep it somewhere if some, anybody can download it. I'm more than happy to do that. Thank you so much, sir, for such a wonderful lecture. I think our participants are overwhelmed by the response uh, they have learned from today's lecture. They learned about how remote sensing will be helpful in agriculture. They learn about different type of sensor, how we can apply them in with the help of different technology, how we can use them for disease management from taking the data and other uses. Further, you have explained how we can use the hyperspectral images and then process it and use it in a very precise form. Thank you so much, sir, from the AgriMeet Foundation for such a wonderful session. Hope to have such few, uh, lectures from you in our future also. So thank you, uh, sir, for such session. So thank you one and all for today's uh, training session. Uh, yeah, you can now uh, leave the session. So that's the end of main, the session. I want to tell you that in 23rd or 25th, there is also a lecture. In 23 I'll see you again tomorrow. Yeah, I'll see you again tomorrow. So today we have talked about the data. Tomorrow we'll talk about how to process it. And then on the, on the 25th, we'll talk about the GIS, how to integrate the data in a GIS platform. So be there. So I request all the participants to be there at time. Uh, as sir is very peculiar and have been with us before time. So I request all the participants to join at 6.20 or 6.25 to learn maximum from sir and to get maximum knowledge from sir PPTs. Thank you so much to all the participants. Thank you, sir. Okay, thank you. We'll see you tomorrow. बहुत बहुत धन्यवाद सर मैं सीएसजीएम यूनिवर्सिटी कानपुर और एग्रीमेंट फाउंडेशन के तत्वाधान में हो रही इस ट्रेनिंग में आपको बहुत बहुत धन्यवाद देता हूँ बहुत बहुत धन्यवाद ठीक है और कैन बी